Hi, welcome to our session, an, introdu an introduction to Twitter for attorneys. My name is Simon Kanick, and I'm here with my colleague Janelle Bites from the Warren E. Berger Library at William Mitchell College of Law. We want to talk about um, and how Twitter works and how lawyers can use it for various purposes and uh, with with different levels of success and intention. Um, today is December 19th. We presented a, a, a variation of this presentation about two weeks ago for a CLE, and we're re-recording it now for posterity. Uh, Janelle, do you want to? Yeah, um, as Simon said, I'm Janelle Bikes. I'm a reference librarian here at the library. I have been sort of tweeting on my own as JK Bytes. You can see the my Twitter handle up on the first page. Um, since June of 2008, and then in May of 2011, I started tweeting as Burger Library for the Warren E. Burger Library. And so one of the things we're going to talk about is how I um, sort of manage those two different personalities and how I view them differently or how you might want to view them differently if you're doing it for yourself versus your firm or your, yourself as a legal professional. And my, my Twitter handle is uh, at Simon Can, and that is kind of a combination of personal and professional work. It seems to be okay for me. I, I started only started tweeting less than a year ago, around, around about March of 2011 at a conference. And maybe I'll say a few words about that experience a, a little bit later, but um, onward. So Twitter is a microblogging platform it that doesn't by itself mean all that much what a microblogging platform is is it's a means of communicating in short bursts like a blog but limited to 140 characters and i guess in this sense twitter is like text messages in the sense that they're very short but unlike text messages Twitter is not limited, of course, to the contact list on your telephone. It's open to anyone. It's a bit like Facebook status updates in that lots of people use Twitter to talk about what they're up to. But unlike Facebook, the foundation of Twitter isn't friendship. It's following other people. Um, or other content. So let's assume that with Twitter we want to accomplish something more than finding yet another way to get updates from friends or acquaintances. With Twitter you follow individuals or stories or topics whose tweets match your interests. And uh, so the foundation here is subject matter, not relationships. And then eventually other people follow you. Okay, lots of people use this for networking and sharing information, keeping up to date on current events and so on. Very easy to sign up. It really just does take just a minute to go through. And I should say at this point, it's very easy if you're a little ambivalent at first, you can choose a Twitter handle that has nothing to do with your name you could create something that is um, Simon5200 or whatever it is just to get started and s sort of get your footing in Twitter. Scrolling through we have uh, a quick startup page and some opportunities to follow um, popular Twitter accounts. You can also import your contact list from your Google Contacts or whatever other uh, service you use. And then you see a big blank space and it says what's happening. And what's happening is, is whatever could, is on your mind. If you have a thought that's um, important or um, intriguing or if you just want to say something hello who's out there and if you say who is anybody out there the answer un undoubtedly is no no one is out there because it's your followers who read your tweets and we don't have any followers yet but we'll talk about how to get some in short order can i interject something really of course quick there? 
one of the resources that I read when I was preparing for this presentation suggested that you 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 make some tweets before you start following anybody um, because this person said well when you start following someone they're gonna look at you and if you don't have any tweets and they're not gonna follow you um, I don't I don't really know if that is anything to be concerned about but if you were were thinking about after you'd been on it for a while as a personal one if you were thinking about that from a professional standpoint it might be something you want to consider I do think and we'll talk more later that it's very beneficial to look at how other people are looking are using t uh, Twitter so I mean I think you want to probably spend some time doing that um, and maybe you not you shouldn't even worry about oh getting followers, but that was one consideration that this lawyer had about tweeting professionally is that get some stuff out there before you're sort of trying to get people to follow you. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I, I don't know. I I guess uh, I guess I'm tempted to like the counter argument a little bit better. That is, follow a bunch of people and see what they do, and you'll I think your gut will tell you what style you like and what doesn't work for you and that will kind of help you to figure out how you want to um, write your own tweets but I, I mean I can see that I can see it both ways it's good to lurk for a while and um, and read what people are doing but uh, but you can also just jump right in there if you want to get a quick follower you could follow the burger library the world famous burger <laughs> library Twitter account which is really, which is really Janelle, and um, and she tweets on all kinds of um, library research, legal education, law student oriented uh, matters, and ha so if you're kind of in one of those categories where um, information for practitioners, you could do that, and I'm sure Janelle would follow you back. But this is kind of how you build your slowly but surely start following people you are interested in and and uh, write useful stuff and people will follow you back here's what your general timeline looks like and as soon as you follow burger library you'll start to see uh, Janelle's tweets pop up in your timeline now um, we'll get into the good stuff we know that Twitter usage is exploding and you know, even amongst attorneys, use is, is um, increasing pretty dramatically. However, just because a lot of people are doing it doesn't mean that you should. So we're gonna we're gonna try to figure out: Does the benefit justify the time? What is the value of tweeting? Um, what can you use it for? And uh, and we'll kick it off right now. I'm gonna turn it over to Janelle. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons you might want to tweet is for marketing purposes. Um, get your name out there. Uh, another one of the resources I read in preparing for this said to, to think of Twitter like a cocktail party. Uh, and he advised that when you're creating your profile bio, you're limited to 160 characters, so you want to make it count. Um, you don't have to waste space in your bio for your firm website because you get another space to put in your firm website. Um, People ask about should I include disclaimers in there, and I've read some posts, uh, some blog posts that say you shouldn't again waste your space with disclaimers. But I have seen firms that do that, and I want to point out here that all of the screen caps that I use um, to tell you why you should tweet and things that you might want to tweet about are from local firms and lawyers. So it can give you some idea of some firms that you might want to whose Twitter feeds you might want to look at. So here's an example of how Moss and Barnett is marketing um, some news about them. Uh, another reason, again, I guess this is, this is the cocktail party, is to network. Um, Twitter is about reaching out and making connections. Um, generally, that's what social media is here for. And people who tweet expect some sort of interaction, and they won't think it's odd that all of a sudden they're hearing from somebody that they might not know who you are. And, and they like it as long as you're sort of thoughtful in your interaction. Um, it's supposed to be like a conversation and eventually I think you, you might fe start to feel like you know some of your followers, at least I do. Um, some followers that I both on my personal account and my Burger Library account that I've never actually met in real life I sort of feel almost close to. 
Um, again, you want you want to be wary of directly so soliciting potential clients, but you should feel comfortable reaching out to other users that you follow or that follow you. Do you think it's Do you think it's different um, than Facebook, for example, in terms of because I, I I hear I think I hear people saying you know they they get to know different people on Facebook and eventually they you get to know them even though you don't really know them all that well. Or, I mean, how is Twitter, do you think, different for than For me, that? and I suppose I'm, this is different for different people, and, and I don't have a, a business Facebook account, but my personal Facebook account, I only am friends with people that, I'm actu that I've actually met, that I actually know in real life. Mm -hmm. um, and Twitter is more people who are interested in the same things, like you said at the beginning, interested in the same things that I am. I've noticed their tweets, and that you know makes me connect in some way, or they've noticed my tweets. Um, and want to make a connection, um, but there are far more people on Twitter that, again, that I've never met. And um, have you than become Facebook. have you become Facebook friends with some of your Twitter acquaintances? One or two of them, but then, but I've actually because they were friends of friends or something, uh -huh. so I, I've actually right. met them. There's nobody that I'm friends with on Facebook that I haven't actually met. Right. Okay. Very interesting. Another reason you might want to tweet is um, to be up on current awareness. For example, the, the death of Osama bin Laden broke on Twitter. And yesterday, the death of Kim Jong-il, I first learned about it on Twitter. Um, there's probably no better place to learn about new news items first. If you log on to Twitter, you'll see a, a trending stories over on the right-hand side. Or it used to be on the right-hand side. They recently changed their platform. And you'll see what, what that is, is what's currently being tweeted about a lot. And most of these things are pop culture items that you probably don't really care about. But still, some real news items do manage to make it through on the trending topics. You know, I, I think uh, Kim, Kim Jong-il actually died from loving his country too much or something like that. Something like that, I think yeah. it was. <laughs> Another reason to tweet would be to keep tabs on your clients. Uh, if your clients are tweeting, um, you'll probably want to know that, note that and may want to follow them. Um, there are some PR gaps that have started with a tweet, so if you're in the uh, business of advising your clients on some of those issues, you would, you'd want to pay attention to that. Um, for example, there was an uh, example earlier, I think in 2009, where a woman, just a, a regular old woman complained about her um, apartment complex apartment manager on Twitter something about mold I think it was and she had like 20 followers at the time but because of that tweet her apartment manager the complex sued her and then of course this blew up and it was all over the um, the tech blogs and the social media blogs and the Huffington Post so it got a lot more exposure than her own little tweet um, and the case was eventually thrown out but those are and and you could also want to keep tabs on your clients for good reasons as Lockridge is doing here I think it's fairly rare to get sued for something you tweet in uh, so don't worry too much no don't that. worry about it um, research is another reason you might want to um, be a tweeting on Twitter. Uh, you obviously wouldn't make Twitter your end stop for your research needs, but it's not a bad first step, especially for newer or um, technology driven issues. And you can um, do a search, like I did a search here for patent law, and then if you have, if you like the results, patent law is not a terribly good example because there are a lot of um, results there. It is a big topic on Twitter. Um, but if you liked the results and you wanted to keep up on that, you can save that search and keep coming back to it and see what people are tweeting on patent law. Or, you know, you could search your client's name or something. Um, following along with this, the research is crowdsourcing. It's sort of a corollary or counterpart to the research. Um, if you want to get other opinion, others' opinions on something, um, presumably you trust the, the people who you're following or who are out there, or you can decide whether or not when you get their response, whether or not you trust them. Um, but you can just sort of throw a question out there, and, and, and you actually get responses, and it's really pretty interesting. You know, I think, um, I think that with disintermediation, with... with um, individual access to lots of different research resources, e even if it's not Westlaw or Lexis, but the internet, people, um, 
may not think of actually talking to, pe to, to others, to experts, to librarians or practitioners. And so many times I have seen law students doing research um, practice exercises going around and around in circles, spending hours and hours on projects when they could have picked up the phone and gotten an answer from someone in no time at all. And Twitter is a way of either getting that answer directly or identifying the people who know the answer quickly, and then you can make contact with them. And, uh, and most people are nice and will help you. So take advantage. Especially if you follow librarians. Librarians are quick to answer. Uh, answer on Twitter and are very eager to to share the information that they know. Yeah, and just generally very cool people. <laughs> uh, another big reason to be on Twitter is to follow conferences. Uh, Twitter is very useful to virtually attend conferences that you can't otherwise attend, or even if you can attend them, if you can't get to all of the sessions, um, you could peek in on what's happening in one session, uh, or you could get real-time opinions on sessions that you're actually attending. Um, t uh, most conferences, especially tech-related conferences, are now saying up front, here is the hashtag for our conference. And so you can follow that hashtag or, or put it into a Twitter search and um, arrange to, to keep following it. Um, and there are also various Twitter apps and add-ons that more easily enable you to follow these hashtag conversations. I think Simon's going to talk about some of them later. Um, so that's one thing that you can do. And, and you know, uh, well, I don't know, if you're like me, then um, you, always, you may always pick the wrong session at a conference. I am the world's worst at picking um, interesting sessions, and I always am sitting there in you know listening to something really boring where you can hear peals of laughter coming from next door and you know that they're just the presenter over there is really killing it so not only can you listen in on the one next door that you should have gone to but you can also make yours much more interesting so for example um, I became interested in Twitter in the first place at a conference presentation that didn't um, that wasn't doing it for me, but I went online and I was monitoring the hashtag and the people who were sitting in the room with me were uh, were talking about what the presenter was saying. And, you know, not in a overly kind of rude and hostile way, but really I thought very constructive. And suddenly my interest level went up and I became engaged again. So then I started looking forward to it. And it was communicating with those folks also helped me for the first time to get some followers, which was nice. And finally, um, the main reason that I personally tweet is because I think it's fun. I really enjoy it. Um, sometimes you get these little funny or sad or, or poignant moments in your life and you want, and now you can verbalize them and sort of put them out there if you want to share them. Um, not that um, everything on Twitter is a little nugget of gold or anything, but it's just, it's fun sometimes if you think of something and you, you put it out there and you share it and then you get a response where you otherwise wouldn't have. Okay, so that's some reasons you might want to tweet. And now I am uh, going to show you a little bit of some uh, people that you, or organizations that you might want to follow or who else is tweeting. Um, Kravath has the one of the disclaimers that I was telling you about. It says, um, content may include attorney advertising. And the funny thing, I point this out, one to point out the disclaimer, but also to tell you that um, Kravath doesn't actually have any tweets. So their yeah. profile is all set up and they have a disclaimer, but they're not doing anything. And I found actually with a lot of law firms that they just have, you know, their avatar and their name on a Twitter feed and they don't have actually any tweets. Um, so for the most part, I'm, I'm trying to show you uh, law firms who actually do tweet, but I do want to point out that some law firms are sort of I don't know, saving their uh, profile. Locally, it seems like Fagri and Benson is the most prolific law firm tweeter. Um, they started in February of 2011. Um, they are not, um, they're not tweeting, you know, 
10, 12 times a day, but they, I think they're the firm that has the most tweets. Um, and here's where you might want to study some law firms posting to see what they're tweeting about, what they do, um, what you like and what you don't like. Um, you might want to pay attention to how many tweets they have or how long they've been tweeting. There's actually a website you can go to how long have you been tweeting dot com with no spaces between the words there and that will tell you how when somebody started tweeting um, if you can't tell it from their profile uh, and you also want to pay more attention I think to whether or not they interact with other um, other people on Twitter out there whether they have any at replies to people um, on Twitter it's really it's not really about how many followers that you have it's it's how you interact with them uh, individual attorneys in the Twin Cities, now the ones that I'm showing you are individual attorneys in the Twin Cities, um, are much more prolific than the law firms than themselves. Um, they also sort of seem more real than a law firm, which, which makes sense. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's impossible to seem real and still be a business entity on Twitter um, if you went go back to that um, S SLWIP's earlier tweet regarding Thomas Edison. I think I think some uh, organizations can still be fun, um, but it is I think more easier for uh, for individuals to seem real than entities. And up here I have some lists um, of some local attorneys that you might want to be interested. Uh, you might want to look at their Twitter feeds. It is included in our bibliography and our. Um, and the slides that we sent out, if you actually attended this, uh, this CLE earlier, if you would like these um, resources, let us know. Well, you know, I think um, if a law firm or any business is tweeting on, on behalf of the business, then a big part of what they're doing is monitoring what people say about them or when their name pops up. Not always, uh, but a lot of times and so they may use it to respond to people who have said one thing or another or just kind of to as a, a, a reputation protector and um, and just to sort of make sure they know what is being said I think as individuals it's easier to speak for yourself and if you are tweeting on behalf of a group then it's harder to know quickly what's okay to say and what what is the opinion of the entity versus the opinion of just yourself and and that's why I think it's it's usually a, a lot more illuminating to follow individuals as tweeters I think that's true and that's actually something I've considered when I'm tweeting as Burger Library um, I there's definitely things that I come across and I think um, I personally would tweet this, but maybe Burger Library shouldn't. Um, mm -hmm. I still think, though, that it's got a little bit of a sense it's of humor and some sort of personality. Yes. But also, if um, but I, I have a luxury; I don't have to be as conservative as most most law firms. Right. Um, and I think also, if your organization has multiple people tweeting for you, on the one hand. I think that's great because you get different voices and, and different thoughts out there, but sometimes it might, it, you might, the group of people who are doing the tweeting might want to come together every once in a while and say, okay, here's some ground rules, or, or just, just to be aware of some issues that could crop up with multiple people purporting to be the same entity. Mm -hmm. And and also, I think Janelle is very protective of the Burger Library account and wouldn't want anybody else to mess with it. When I started, I I, I gave it to everybody and I said, "Hey, everybody, help me join in," and, and nobody did. Um, so at first, I thought, "Yeah, it'll be a, it'll be a group project." But now you're right; I do kind of feel protective <laughs> about it. But if other people wanted to, I wouldn't tell them they couldn't. <laughs> Um, a lot of administrative agencies have Twitter accounts, which I think is sort of fascinating. There's, if you Google government Twitter accounts or something like that, you can find several lists of um, government entities that have Twitter accounts, and there's a lot of them, and most of them are very prolific and very up-to-date, very current. Uh, lots of libraries have Twitter accounts. Um, some of my favorite Twitter accounts, I think, are library accounts. Uh, these accounts are typically good with several updates a day, 
Um, a lot of government offices have Twitter accounts. The Justice Department, I want to point out the Justice's Department disclaimer. It's my favorite disclaimer. Um, DOJ does not collect comments or messages through this account. Learn more at justice.gov slash privacy file htm. I just thought that was hilarious that um, people are afraid that the DOJ Twitter account is going to be collecting information on them. Mm -hmm. I think the Law Library of Congress is one of my favorite accounts. They are very prolific, um, very uh, current, uh, several times a day, even on the weekends. And they do a really good job, I think, of being uh, fun and interesting while still being completely professional. Mm -hmm. Uh, some local organizations, well, the ABA isn't local, but some organizations or agencies that you, that might interest you um, who have Twitter accounts are up on the screen. Uh, many colleges and universities have Twitter accounts. You can um, keep up on your alma mater's news in a quick and easy way. A lot of politicians have Twitter accounts, and sometimes it gets them into trouble. I'm uh. sure we all remember Representative, um, is it Weiner or Wiener? <laughs> and as I mentioned earlier, your clients might be tweeting. Um, I did a search for Minnesota companies on Twitter or something, and, and I got quite a few of them. Now, these are biggies, obviously, but uh, I think I don't have a screenshot for them, but I think Zappos Twitter account is sort of the gold standard of corporate tweeting. Um, they are, and I've I, I don't follow them personally, but I have looked at it several times. It's fun. It's interesting. They do little contests. They actually interact with their followers, um, and it, but it's still completely professional. If your client tweets, you might want to um, know about about it, or or maybe you don't. Um, and some corporations are using Twitter as a customer service method. As an example, I once. Me personally, not me, Burger Library, uh, made a complaint about Westlaw Next. Just I was just ranting. I wasn't really looking for um, any any direct feedback. I think my complaint was, you know, when I put something in quotes, Westlaw Next, I really want it to be searched as a phrase, not not as individual words. And um, Westlaw, or somebody from Westlaw, um, actually emailed me at my work email address, which isn't connected to my personal Twitter account at all. They actually figured out my name from my personal Twitter account and figured out my um, work email address for that and contacted me, which was kind of off-putting. I sort of expected a, a Twitter response, but not an email response at a completely unrelated ac um, account. But I think, you know, for some people that wouldn't be off-putting at all. And, and for the corporation, I'm sure they thought it was great customer service. <laughs> So you can't search for a phrase on Westlaw Next? You have to go into the advanced search. If you put a phrase into Westlaw Next, it will not treat it as a phrase. So unless you do it are disregarded completely? Yes, unless you're in the advanced search. Oh, uh, that's crazy. <laughs> that's what I thought. <laughs> I think I'm going to tweet about that. <laughs> Anonymously. <laughs> Um, so now, so now I've convinced you that you you want to tweet and that there's people out there that you want to follow, and so now you're like, well, what what should I tweet? Um, you could t if you have if your firm has a blog, you could tweet your blog posts. Um, you probably should tweet your blog posts to gain uh, more exposure. Um, it's sort of accepted that you might tweet the same post multiple times. There's literature out there about how many too, how many times is too many times. I probably wouldn't do it more than twice a day. Um, and obviously, if you're going to be tweeting your blog posts or any uh, news stories that you come across, you're going to want to use your URL shorteners um, because URLs can take up a lot of your 140 characters. Um, additionally, this goes through all the everything I'm going to say coming up that you don't, that Twitter shouldn't be used just to self-promote. Mm -hmm. um, it's supposed to be a conversation and too much of me, 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 or my firm, my firm, my firm um, will turn people off. Mm -hmm. it, se it seems to me that there are plenty of people out there that have a lot of followers, but they follow no one and their tweets are just broadcast messages, which, and apparently there are plenty of people who do like that or are willing to accept it because they want the information but I agree personally I think it's off-putting if you see somebody with you know tons and tons of followers who obviously never actually engages with anyone and who follows no one so 
similar to your firm blog post, you might want to post your uh, tweet your firm news, um, especially if good things about your firm are coming up in the local newspapers, for example. Um, you should probably have a Google alert on your name and or your law firm's name, and then when your firm or you gets mentioned favorably in the press, you can tweet that. Um, and you probably should set up a Google alert anyway, and if you get mentioned unfavorably, then you can quickly deal with that, although obviously you're not going to want to tweet it. Uh, interesting stories. Um, as Burger Library, I could probably simply just tweet the Wall Street Journal's law.com blog stories and have a completely full Twitter feed. I wouldn't advise doing that, but it's there's certainly a lot of legal blogs out there that are interesting and you could just um, basically promote their stories. Um, and that would be a way, again, I don't think I would advise it because it makes you of less uh, seem less real, um, but that would be one way to avoid some of the ethical issues that we'll be discussing in a little bit a uh, little bit later. But you know, as everybody as everybody knows, there's um, there's way too much information out there to keep up with, and nobody is reading every blog and so on. And if you end up following people who post fascinating stories from a variety of sources then I think that's quite valuable because and and I, I try to do this too I, I guess I, I figured that things cross my path from a variety of different sources sometimes people email me an article that um, that they like or I might pick it up from Twitter or I might pick it up from Reddit or I might pick it up from a Google search and I think generally if I it, if it's something that piques my own interest or curiosity, then I figure somebody else might want to know about it too. And I'll put it out there. And what I try to do, if you have the space, is to, to do a little, a few little words on why you think it's interesting, mm -hmm. why you think your followers should read it. Um, that's, because That's a good idea. A title may not be enough. Exactly. Uh, you might want to tweet news from the court. I don't think right now that any of the Minnesota courts have a Twitter account, but they do have a website that publishes news stories on a regular basis. Um, the Minnesota appellate courts also have their opinions that, that come out every week, and you could summarize and tweet some of those if they relate to you or your practice. Um, you might want to consider adding hashtags so that other people interested in that topic will know will come across it even if they're not following you necessarily. And then again, it can build up um, reasons for people who are interested in the same things to follow you. Did you introduce the topic of hashtags? You know, I can't remember. I mean, I, don't I know think you I did. talked about in, in the context of conferences, you mentioned how conferences will promote. OK, so that was it. So well, conferences will promote a hashtag. I don't know if we have an example of one. Was there one over here? No. Uh, well, well, I'm sure we'll see one in a short while. It's it's the number sign and then some some word or a combination of words or that that will um, that will enable people to 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 find all of the responses on that topic very easily and fit that into their feed. Now, anyway, we'll we'll get back to that in a short while. Uh, you could tweet your non-law activities. Uh, it will get your other activities recognized and let people know you as something other than a lawyer, make you more of a real person. Um, I would not be tweeting things like, I'm brushing my tweet teeth now, or I'm going to go eat a, a sandwich or something like that. Um, again, you don't want to make it all about you. And I think originally that was more that was going on on Twitter but that's really not happening anymore except celebrities yeah that's right yeah <laughs> because because we all want to know <laughs> what Ashton Kutcher is doing tweeting your non-law activities also gives you a chance to promote causes that are near and dear to your heart here we go here's the hashtag is coming ah, up again here we go um, so, and we mentioned this before when we are talking about following uh, uh, conferences. If you are involved in a conference or a seminar or a CLE, you can tweet that. And this is Winthrop's um, Twitter account. And earlier this year, they were actually um, hosting a director's roundtable event. So they were also tweeting about it. And you see this um, number sign, DRD Fact. It stands for, I believe, Director's Roundtable. And then I don't know what the D Fact part was. I couldn't figure it out. 
Um, so they added this little uh, code to, to these tweets so that people who were interested in that topic would be able to find it quickly and easily. Sorry. Um, and so if you are giving a CLE, you might want to say at the beginning, um, we're going to use this hashtag for the CLE. And you might want to have a colleague in the room um, tweeting for you. Um, so that would be another way to get people to, um, to, to know what you're doing and, um, and to follow you. And you'll see, a lot, I mean, like Asperger Library, I'm, I'm constantly using hashtags when I'm promoting blog posts or something like that, like First Amendment or law students or exam. This time of year, I was doing a lot of, um, you know, hashtag exams um, because other people will look for those topics. And then if they find you and they like the other things that you tweet, they might follow you. Is that a good enough yes, coverage? Yes, absolutely. Hashtags? Thank you. Um, and we've probably... Uh, pretty much touch on this before, but um, relevant news items. If you're reading the Star Tribune, you could post oh, one of the stories there. Especially if the news story is relevant to your practice, you might want to tweet it. Again, probably adding a hashtag to it. Um, and I've talked about this before. When I'm tweeting stories, I try to add something to the conversation rather than just the headline. Um, sometimes the story is enough by itself, and sometimes you just don't have the space. Um, but if you can, try to add something, even if it is just the hashtag. Like for this tweet right here, I would shorten the URL and um, put uh, number sign patents, and mm -hmm. that shows why it's interesting, why you find it interesting, and also why other people might find it interesting, and makes it more visible in a Twitter search. Yes. Ah, okay. So a few nuts and bolts here. This is a view of my timeline for one uh, day, one morning. The timeline is where tweets come in from the people that I'm following. Um, usually, well, it seems like these these three at least are mostly informational. So there are references to sites where you can get content, and if I think that there's something here that is really worth sharing, I can retweet it. Retweeting is probably uh, is is one of the great innovations of Twitter, and you can see by the graph the concept is that somebody posts an um, a link to their followers and any of their followers can retweet it which not only is broadcasting it to all of their followers which are probably you know a whole number of different people but also gives it a little cachet in a certain way it is saying yeah out of all the tweets that I've received this one is really good and I want you to see it and then sometimes they take on a life of their own and things can go viral. Here's an example simply of um, of a post from Sarah saying, I mean, you know, here's a, an, uh, an, an article about top educational technology trends, which I retweeted, and you can see retweeting uh, creates like a little, uh, I'm going to see if I can do this, yeah, a little point in the in the corner where you can see it. Depends on what Twitter service you use how retweet is noted in the system. Okay, also I guess I would say that all retweets are not created exactly equal. I think from a marketing perspective it's helpful to get retweeted by people who are uh, pretty established on Twitter or well respected in their field and so on. So. Um, it could be that my tweet gets retweeted by somebody who has a few followers, and that's always nice, and, and maybe I build a relationship with that person. But here's an individual who has 1,860 followers, so it's nicer in a certain way to get his retweet. Now, these relationships where you can get retweeted by somebody who has a lot of followers take some time to develop, and I think you can get there I mean, not in a in an overly cynical way, but you do want to make contact with people who um, are doing interesting work and who uh, are well regarded, and you can find those people and take an interest in what they're doing and write to them about it or think about what they're up to, and before long, they're going to start following you and they're going to start seeing what you have to offer. I think it's also a psychological thing. There's something that feels good about getting retweeted or noticed in some way. I think 
it could be, as, as Janelle alluded to earlier, it could be that it's just an article that no one has found before. But I, my sense is that people really respond to the original content that you put out. If you really give something of yourself, you write a blog post or if you write an essay and you put it up online somewhere, something that is new and different and where you really put some time into it, that is more likely to get noticed and, uh, and get some attention, which is how it should be. One way of um, getting people's attention is to compliment them when they've done something good. Again, not in, not in, at least not entirely in a kind of marketing way, but just remember, people like that. Um, just on a personal level, people like it, and don't forget to be nice. So I think that, for example, Fast Case has a really good means for finding cases. It's different than what any other service has on the market. It's very visual and and quite powerful. So I wanted to say that, and um, Ed Walters is the CEO of Fast Case, and I figured I would let him know that I think it's great. And he was appreciative of that. And I probably their team was appreciative of the, the positive press. So that's a nice that's a nice thing as well. Okay. Um, a great way of finding people to follow is to think about the people who you already follow on Twitter and, and whose tweets are uh, you know that that they affect you in some way or that they have a high success rate in terms of you know putting forth good content content that you like so just for example if i think that sarah glassmeyer has um a lot of useful things to say then what i would do is is look at the 220 people that she's following and there's a really good chance that um that she has a lot of um, uh, followers who are worth following in their own right. And I find that by this process of going through a little bit, I branch out far beyond libraries or my own kind of my own little universe. And I start finding people who are tweeting about subjects that are maybe indirectly related to what I do, but absolutely fascinating stuff. And occasionally, um, they have a meaningful effect on what I'm doing. It really informs it in, in a new way. Ah, and, and this is just uh, a slide that conveys that concept. I can look at uh, Sarah's followers and decide to follow them as well. Okay, so here is the slide again of my timeline. And Janelle mentioned before the URL shorteners. So instead of using a super long link from a website you should uh, shorten it and you should do that really I mean this is this is important advice because again you just have you have such a small amount of space that you want the URL to take as little space as you possibly can the URL shorteners there are some there's one that's built into Twitter. There are lots of others that you'll see around Google has one. You can see the bottom slide, the bottom uh, um, tweet there. But the one that I use a lot is Bitly. Um, you can see that in the middle tweet. These are great not only because they shorten your URL, but because they give you a sense of, sorry, they give you a sense of who's using your link. So Bitly for example, tracks the amount of um, a traffic that your link generates on Twitter, either through people directly clicking on it or if people have retweeted it, it captures all that. And so I can find out how many people have clicked on it and I can find out sort of over a long period of time what kinds of things my followers are interested in reading and what kinds of things get no clicks. And you can do that if you have a, a blog and you want to keep track of, like, are people just sort of stumbling across my blog or are they coming because I'm directing them to it? That would be another reason to, to get uh, use Bitly or, or one of the other URL shorteners to tell how your various efforts at social media are working and mm. which ones are working better than others. That's right, because it will tell you that, you know, some some 
percentage of your traffic came from, say, an email, direct email a link, and some of it came from Twitter, and some of it came from, is that what you yeah. remind mind? That kind of thing. Or some from a Facebook post. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it really is. It's good analytics there. And here's the timeline again. Here's an example of a hashtag. This one is education. As you go along and start to tweet and start to gain followers, you'll start to notice hashtags. And if you click on one of them, for example, if, if I want to see what other people are posting about education, I can just simply click on the hashtag for education and then I'll get results for it and you can see there's I mean these are people who I haven't I've never followed and probably never heard of before but as I as I go through and scroll through them I can see that there are some pretty interesting things it's a good way of finding other people to follow or as you can see up on the top of the screen with save the search I can simply save the hashtag because maybe I don't want to follow all of these people, but I do want to follow them for the purpose of following education-related tweets. Anybody who tweets with this hashtag will pop into my timeline as well, or one of my saved search timelines. And one last thing before I turn it back over to Janelle. I think th there's nothing in particular that's wrong with Twitter.com. And as a matter of fact, I believe this has changed and you know in this slide ha would look different today than it did a couple of weeks ago because they have been making a lot of changes to their interface but people who tweet a lot tend to find um, fault in the interface or they find that it's limited after a while so there's nothing wrong with it but you should know that you can see your information in lots of other ways. There are many different interfaces for Twitter, mobile ones and browser-based ones and software-based ones. Here's an example of one that uh, is called TweetDeck. It's really kind of this, it's a dashboard, if you will, and the different columns represent the different things you might be searching for at one time. For example, on the left is my general timeline. The second one is any time my Twitter handle gets mentioned. So if somebody retweets something that I had to say or sends me a message, it will pop in there. And my other searches as well. For example, on the far right was the hashtag that Janelle and I used for our CLE a couple of weeks ago and then a regular search that I have for William Mitchell and you can kinda of, this is kinda of your command central there's all there are lots of others and, and you can if you do a Google search for um, Twitter interfaces or Twitter apps you can find all kinds of things and, and poke through it. I think um, I think TweetDeck is probably the most popular I like Hootsuite, um, and it's pretty much the same thing. I just like how it looks better, and it's also not oh, it's not owned by Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and and some of the other things that some of the reasons that I like using Hootsuite rather than the Twitter.com interface is number one, I can schedule tweets with Hootsuite, and you can do this with TweetDeck too. So if I'm reading my my typical um, routine is to go through my RSS feeds in the morning, and I'll have maybe 60 of them. And instead of tweeting all the stories that I find interesting all at once, so that I sort of clog up people's Twitter feed, I can schedule them like one every hour throughout the day or something like that. So that's the big thing, the the main reason I think uh, I like to use Hootsuite. The other reason is um, Simon talked earlier about earlier about retweeting. When you are retweeting from the Twitter.com interface, it just sends the retweet automatically as it originally looked to all of your followers. So it's sort of like your followers also followed the person that you retweeted. Um, when I was talking earlier about adding something to the conversation, when I retweet people, if I can, I like to add something to the conversation, say why I'm retweeting it, why I found it interesting, again, if I have the space. And Twitter.com's interface won't let me do that, but Hootsuite and TweetDeck do. So those are the um, big reasons. I think also people like TweetDeck and Hootsuite because you can, for one, you can combine it with your Facebook um, 
uh, page if you wanted to. And if you had two Twitter accounts, you could mm -hmm. look at them both at once. That's always been too confusing to me, and I don't want to mix up my Twitter personality, mm -hmm. so I don't do that. But I think that's a big reason people use TweetDeck and Hootsuite. That's that, that's all really good advice. I, you'll notice as you start using Twitter that, well, you can see up in mentions there, um, the first two are um, retweets with nothing added. But oh well, that's not true. Actually, on the on the second one down, uh, John Mayer has added some content at the end of the tweet. Live long and learn more. Okay, well. What I would do in a situation like that is, um, instead of calling it an RT retweet, I would call it a um, an MT modified tweet, and I would probably put it in the front so that your commentary doesn't get lost at the back. Everybody's got their own idea about how it should look, and with a modified tweet, if you're running out of space, you can you can try to um, edit down the original tweet okay. without changing the 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 uh, the idea or the the content of it. So if you do change the original tweet, you really shouldn't use RT because RT suggests that it's the same message as as it was at first. The other little code that you see a lot is HT for hat tip. So if you get information from somebody's blog or or from or even from somebody's Twitter account and you're not really again retweeting the whole thing, you're just taking say the link from it, then you can have your own note and then you have the link and then you'll have like HT for hat tip to whoever gave you the, yeah, the tip. And it, the tip can come in all kinds of different forms. It can be totally aside from Twitter like uh, like an email. Janelle might send me an email that says, hey have you seen this? And the answer is no and then I might want to tweet about it so I'll just give her credit for um, pointing me in the right direction. Okay, so we're very briefly going to talk about a couple of ethics issues that you will want to be aware of. Um, and there are probably other ethics rules that are in play here. Um, I, for, I didn't touch any on any of the ones that might apply if you're using Twitter as a research tool in litigation, for example. Um, this isn't an ethics CLE, but I wanted to make sure we didn't blithely skip over these issues. Simon and I are not practicing attorneys, so we kind of have the luxury of not having to worry about these, but I just wanted to let you know that we know that you do. Um, on the advertising point, the Bench and Bar had a, the Minnesota Bench and Bar had a good blog post about it last year. It's Again, it's on our bibliography and our Digo links at the very beginning of the screen. There's a, um, there's a, a link to, to where to where all of our links are for about for on this presentation, um, and this blog post goes through the professional conduct rules and what you should be wary of uh, on solicitation. And I, you know, I said several times we both said that Twitter is about reaching out and making connections. You're just going to want to be careful how you do it. Um, obviously, uh, Twitter can raise representation questions about when the attorney-client relationship starts. Um, the, there's a good research on uh, resource on conf confidentiality. Uh, Michael Bradley gave a CLE in October called "Social Social Media and Lawyer Ethics: The Medium Is Not the Message." He analogizes posting something online that's publicly accessible, whether through Twitter or a blog, as similar to making a statement in a crowded restaurant, putting up flyers in public places, or even shouting it from the steps of the courthouse as opposed to making the statement at a private party or an office meeting. Um, if you blog or have other presences where people could connect those presences with, um, with your Twitter account and discover information about client representation that they might not have discovered through your Twitter account alone, you'll want to be aware of that. Um, uh, Rule 1.6 uh, Subdivision 7 also brings up the point that if you want, you can submit a request for advisory opinion to the Office, office of Lawyers Professional Responsibility if you have a question about your social media use, as long as it's something that, you know, hasn't happened yet, as long as it's something that you're asking about for the future rather than past conduct. Um, false and misleading statements, uh, don't lie or inflate yourself on Twitter or other places on the web. Um, and I, I think kind of that's sort of just a general uh, tip for on the web. You probably don't want to lie about yourself. Um, uh, you, you're going to want to be aware of what other Twitter users are saying about you too on the web. So follow your at uh, if somebody, if people, 
you know, send messages to you. Um, the jurisdiction question I just think is sort of um, interesting uh, because the internet is not geographically static. You may want to be aware of uh, other states' ethics rules with regard to your use on Twitter. The ABA has a really good document um, demonstrating some of the differences in state advertising and solicitation rules, so you'll want to look at that. You also want to know that, or should know, that the ABA is discussing these issues um, with its Commission on Ethics 2020, and you want to, you probably want to keep your eye open on that. Again, it's in our bibliography. Um, so far, the um, the Minnesota board has not uh, made any proclamations about Twitter um, or really very many social media uh, social media issues. Although they have um, had some discussions about um, cloud computing and uh, what's the word I'm looking for. Um, metadata. Okay, I think we're gonna we're gonna end up um, just talking for a, a minute or two about how Twitter fits in with everything else in life. There's just too much. I understand there's too much. I feel that way too. Um, Google Plus has come out recently. It's Google's. I think third social network in the last 18 months. Facebook is everybody, everybody's on it. There's LinkedIn, there's Twitter. How does it fit in? What are you supposed to do? And not to mention, you may blog, you could use Blogger, or WordPress, or Tumblr, and put all that stuff out there. And so we're asking you maybe to add another thing. I don't know, how do you want to play it? And I think the issue in in some is finding out where at least for me finding out where the conversations are happening online and being active and in some way establishing your professional digital identity uh, what is your online voice who are you who do you want to be in this environment whether the environment is facebook or twitter i I think everybody, every attorney, every individual has to become comfortable sometime with posting information online. So your preferences in terms of, you know, do you like Twitter versus something else? That's part of it, but you should be somewhere. And I think the, the, the key point perhaps is where are the conversations taking place online? It could be that for your niche area, people are using discussion forums on LinkedIn. Or it could be that there is an old-fashioned listserv on your topic and you just receive the messages by email and sometimes participate that way. Or it could be that it's Twitter or some combination of those things. Um, figure out where the conversations are happening and participate. And if it's not on Twitter, you could use Twitter and strike out on your own. I mean, it depends if your objective is professional networking or um, indirectly generating client contacts and so on. And it depends on what appeals to you. I think that it's important to be social and to be out there. So, I don't know, do you have anything to add to uh, no, I don't think so. I think, um, as you mentioned, like finding your voice and the voice that you want to put out there is um, important, and it, it takes some time. I um, I am pretty comfortable with Burger Library now, but I still have some things where I'm like, oh, should should Burger Library really tweet that, or um, what are students? My my main audience when I am being Burger Library is my is the students. Even though actually most of my followers are not are not students, but that's who I'm always thinking of. So if you have an audience that you're sort of directing things to, I think it helps it helps to develop that voice. Um, and and I and I think that especially when I'm considering reaching out to one of the students, I want to do that I, because I don't want them to think that I'm a bot up there just tweeting um, blog posts. And actually, my my best interactions, my best responses have been to individual students about, we'll say, the candy at the reference desk. Or one time one of the students was looking for Halloween costumes, and it had just happened that I'd read a really fun blog post about Halloween costumes. So I tweeted that to him, and he was very appreciative. Um, and so that's that's fun. Um, 
but I, I do also when they're complaining about things, I don't catch those tweets. <laughs> I don't. That's that's uh that's everybody needs to vent and they're not necessarily looking for me to give them some I don't know guidance on how to deal with their finals and you know not to drink or whatever um, so I'm, I'm always sort of consciously aware of that and it took me some time to develop that who who Burger Library is as a personality as opposed to who I am on my own Twitter account um, there's probably an article in there somewhere mm -hmm. it would so. be fun to write <laughs> Well, I, it's been an hour, and we, we want to thank you. Well, we want to thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions for us, we'd be happy to uh, to chat with you about it on Twitter or offline, if you like. Um, take care. Hope you have a happy holiday. Bye now.